Thank you, Pastor Brian. And uh, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to be reading just uh, a few verses from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And I also will be adding chapter 5, verse 1 to our reading this morning. Paul says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Amen. You'll notice if uh, you have been joining us for our services over the past number of weeks that this passage is quite similar to the passage that Pastor Brian spoke from a couple of weeks ago from Romans chapter 8. That idea that uh, our current sufferings, our current difficulties are achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. I'm not going to revisit that idea that uh, Pastor Brian um, spoke from uh, this morning. What I want to do is I want to focus on what Paul says in verse 18, that he says, we fix our eyes on things that are unseen, because those things that are seen are temporary. They are transient, but those things that are unseen are eternal. I've taken my title from a book uh, that some of you may be familiar with uh, by uh, an author named Mark Buchanan, who is a pastor who has uh, written a book entitled Things Unseen, Living in Light of Eternity. Last week, we looked at Psalm 146. And uh, we focused on the first two verses of that psalm, where the psalmist calls us and uh, uh, enjoins us to praise the Lord. And he says, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. And from that, uh, I spoke about the discipline of praise, that it is important for us as God's people to develop a discipline of praise so that we don't become entrenched in the things, the troubles, and the misery, and the difficulties of life, even though we may trust God and, and, uh, and, and we have faith in God, sometimes our lives are more like clinging to the edge of a cliff than they are praising God for the wonder of who he is. So that was last week's sermon, Nurturing and Cultivating a Discipline of Praise. And this week, I want to speak about another discipline that Scripture calls us to cultivate. And it is uh, talked about, Paul talks about it with, with those words that he gives us in verse 18 of the passage that we read. We fix our eyes not on those things that are seen, but on those things that are unseen. Scripture calls us to the discipline of learning to live in the present, in the now, but at the same time living and thinking in light of eternity, having our minds and our hearts and our eyes set on those things that are eternal. Of course, these are disciplines that we should always be cultivating in our lives. Scripture calls us to them, and they have a huge impact on the way that we see the world and on the way that we live. But they're especially relevant in these uncertain times. 
because they remind us that whatever turmoil we may be experiencing, whatever troubles we're facing, whatever fears and uncertainties this uh, current situation brings our way, that there is an eternal reality. There is a God that is worthy of our praise, and there is an eternal reality that we are called to, that we can put our hope in, that God is taking us to. It's easy to become consumed with our troubles and to lose sight of God and his worthiness of our praise. And by the same token, it's easy for us to become focused not on eternity, but on the now. And we ask ourselves the question, kind of like the Verizon commercial that uh, the guy was walking around saying, can you hear me now? We ask the question, we go through life asking the question, am I happy now? Am I comfortable now? Do I feel secure now? How many of you feel the pull of the now? It's a strong pull, isn't it? There is a popular preacher that probably most of us know his name that tells us week after week that God wants you to have your best life now. What an appealing message that is. And it's an attractive one. There are a couple of reasons, I think, why the now holds such a powerful, has such a powerful hold on us. First of all, it's because the now seems so real. Because we are material beings, we are equipped to see the material world. So the part of reality that we can see is what seems most real to us. That, that's really only natural that that would be the case. The difficulty is, I think, that we become so accustomed to seeing the world that way and living in the material world that we drift toward the mindset, even if we would disagree with it, if we stop and think about it, we still drift toward that mindset that What we can perceive is really the only thing that exists. And that, of course, is the modern worldview, what is often referred to as materialism or naturalism. The material world, the things of this world, are the only things that really exist at all. Uh, As part of uh, the media's response to uh, to the uh, coronavirus, I saw an ad on PBS for a, for an upcoming um, show that was going to be aired, and I can't remember if it was a frontline show or exactly what it was, but uh, the ad essentially asked the question, and I was encouraged when I heard the question. The question was, where can we find certainty in these uncertain times? That's a good question to ask. That's a question that I would encourage all of us to ask. But then the ad goes on to give us this, or at least to propose this answer. Where can we find certainty in these uncertain times? Science. Only science can provide us with the certainty that we are looking for. Another reason I think that uh, we become so uh, drawn to the now is that our prosperity actually tends to lure us into a preoccupation with the present and with things. Our prosperity enables us to accumulate a tremendous amount of material things. Stop and think about all the stuff you have. And not only all the stuff you have, But if you stop and think about it, all that stuff is kind of a burden, isn't it? Because it all has to be maintained. It all has to be taken care of. It all has to be guarded from whoever it is that might want to take it away. We have more stuff 
in our contemporary lives than anyone in the course of history has ever dreamed of having. We have all the comforts that we could ask for. We have warm homes and plenty of food and lots of conveniences and lots of toys. But because we do, we are inclined to define our lives by what we have. Our value as a person is tied to the prestige of our job or our earning power. Our security is tied to how much money is in the bank or how much we've saved for retirement. Our happiness is tied to how many toys we have and how spacious our house is and the opportunities that we have for recreation, for play and for food and for entertainment. So just as uh, we are apt to focus our attention on how difficult our lives are rather than how amazing God is, which is what I talked about last week, we also feel the pull of the now, lulling us into a state of spiritual amnesia, acclimating us to the idea that what we can see is all that is real, inviting us to sink our roots into the things that we possess and define our lives by the material world, which seems to offer us so much. We feel the pull of the now. Remember the words of Jesus where he tells us life does not consist in the accumulation of things. The Bible insists that in spite of appearances, the world of material things is only part of a much bigger reality. The vast majority of that reality remains unseen. We don't have access to that reality with our physical perception. But nevertheless, it is there. It's that unseen reality, not the world that we can see, that provides us the only sufficient foundation on which we can build our lives. That unseen reality is just as real, even more real than what we can see. And it is the only sufficient foundation that we can build our lives on. Remember the children's song some of us grew up singing based on Jesus' parable in Matthew 7? The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came down and the flood came up and the house on the, on the sand fell down. The problem with building on the sand is that when the floods come, the rain can wash the sand out from under the house until there is nothing left to support it and it collapses. And uh, we have seen the pictures from even over the past couple of years of homes on Lake Michigan as the uh, lake waters have risen and homes built too close to the shore. Uh, the banks that they have been built on years ago, assuming that they were secure, have been washed away, have been eroded away. And we've seen the dramatic pictures of houses falling into the lake. We've seen other pictures from Florida of sinkholes opening up. Again, sand that cannot support the foundation falling away. We need a foundation for our lives, but Jesus warns us that the now, the things of this world, the things that are seen, is not an adequate foundation. We've been experiencing that, you might call it a sinkhole effect, over the past number of weeks. 
The coronavirus, in a sense, has been like a big wave that has washed the sand out from under us, and we have watched as the foundations we thought were so strong have eroded. We've witnessed as the edifices that we have built, things like our economic system and our healthcare system and our food distribution system, things that we much of the time don't even think about. We just depend on them without thinking, but we have seen them begin to crumble in just a few weeks. A reality check exposing just how fragile and precarious so many of the things that we depend on really are. And we may, in fact, and it is likely that we will find our way back to a place of stability, but the thing that I, th- I hope that we learn from this, that we remember as we go forward, is that the things that we build our lives on and sink our roots into are like sand. It can so easily be washed away. So why is this world that we can see that seems so real to us, why is it in an adequate foundation for building our lives on? First of all, Paul really addresses that that question in his statement when He says that the things that are seen, the things of this world, the material world that we live in, is temporary. Nothing in this world lasts. We build our castles only to find that they are castles of sand and the waves of time wash them away. Those who are strong inevitably succumb to weakness and death. All the great civilizations in history have fallen. And all that is left of them is crumbling ruins and relics of a glory that lasted but just a moment, if you think about it, in terms of the scope of history. Relics of times that have long been forgotten. There are a number of passages, I think, of uh, the prophet Isaiah who speaks to this, and Peter also quotes from Isaiah, where scripture tells us all men are like grass. They're like the flowers of the field. They flourish for a season, but quickly wither and die. We have flowers that grow up every spring in our lawn, and they come up and they are incredibly beautiful, these bright electric blue flowers. And I actually looked up the name this week, Siberian something, and I've already forgotten the name. But the thing about it is, as brilliant and as wonderful and beautiful as they are, in a matter of a couple of weeks, they are gone. Not even a trace that they were ever there. James says something similar in chapter 4 and verse 14 of, of his letter. He says, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning mist. It is here for a little while, and then it is gone. Isn't that an encouraging thought? Our life, this life in this world is like a mist. It's like a vapor. A wisp that lingers for a moment and is gone. The world of things is an inadequate foundation because it is a foundation of sand. It is always passing away and eroding out from under us. There's another reason why the world of things is inadequate as a foundation for our lives. And that is because we were not made for this world. So no matter how hard we try, we will never really feel at home here. There will always be something missing that this world can't provide. Have you ever noticed that the more people have, the more discontented they tend to be? 
contentment, true satisfaction always seems to elude us. It always seems as though something is missing. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, in the chapter that he wrote um, on hope, makes this argument. He says, most people, if they really look into their hearts, would realize that they want something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things that offer to give it to you, but they never keep their promise. Even the best that life has to offer falls short of satisfying our longings. It, he uses just that word, it, to express that thing that we're looking for, desire that eludes us. It continues to evade us. And he goes on to say, now I want to clarify, I'm not talking about a bad vacation or a bad marriage or a difficult job. He says, I'm talking about the best vacation." a wonderful marriage, a stellar career, and even when we experience all of the goodness, the best that life has. Still, there is something in us that remains unsatisfied. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes in Scripture, one of the things that the writer of Ecclesiastes sets out to do, he sets out basically on a project to find out what is there in this world that can satisfy the yearnings of the soul. And ultimately his conclusion is nothing. Vanity, he says, all is vanity. The fact is, when our deepest wishes and yearnings are realized, we then realize that we have still deeper yearnings that remain unsatisfied. Like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, the satisfaction of our deepest longings persistently eludes us. And so in the in the wisdom of that great sage Bono from U2, we have to agree, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. C.S. Lewis goes on to say that our experience tells us that there is a correspondence in the real world between desire and the satisfaction of desire. So that we are able to observe that when a creature has a desire, we find that there is something in the world that is there to satisfy that desire. And Lewis says this, he says, people were not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. There is such a thing as food. A duckling was made to swim, and there is such a thing as water. So, he says, if I find myself, if I find in myself a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, the most reasonable explanation is that I was made for another world. If earthly pleasures cannot satisfy my desire, then probably earthly pleasures were not meant to satisfy that desire, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing that is there, that can satisfy. And the Bible tells us that there is such a place where that longing in our hearts can be satisfied and will be satisfied. A place that we were made for. A place where we belong. A place that is home. 
This world that we can see that seems so real and yet fails to satisfy our deepest yearnings is not all there is, Scripture tells us. There is, in fact, a much bigger reality. And though at present it is only visible to the eyes of faith, it is nevertheless very real. This world, this world of unseen things is always passing away. This world of seen things, sorry. See how easy it is to get all discombobulated? This world of seen things is always passing away. But the unseen, Paul says, is eternal. And it is for that world, the eternal world, that we were made. And it is our true home. Not just, and this is an important point to, to catch. This is, the, that world is our true home, not just because it is a better place or because it is eternal. It has a different quality. It's not temporary. That's not why it is our true home. It is our true home because God is there. Psalm 46, verses 40 and five, 4 and 5 say, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, that city that is the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells there in that city, and it cannot be destroyed. The writer to the Hebrews in the great chapter on faith in Hebrews chapter 11 tells us and speaks about this city, a city that is not built by human hands, that God has prepared. And for the people of God, this world will never be home, the writer to the Hebrews tells us. Because like Abraham, who God had called away and said, leave your home, leave the place that you have called home, the place that cannot satisfy you, the place that is not your true home, leave that home and follow me and I will take you to a better country, a heavenly one, the home that we were made for. And so the writer to Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes, after he has embarked on this project and found that the world of things can never satisfy us, one of the conclusions he comes to is that God has put eternity in our hearts. That's why we can't be satisfied with temporality, because God has put a seed of eternity in our hearts that longs for a true home, an eternal home. Reflecting on our human yearnings that never seem to be satisfied and the Bible's claim that only God can satisfy them. St. Augustine said this, a, a quote that you have probably heard before. He said, Thou, God, hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Blaise Pascal, another great Christian thinker, said this. He said, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God, the creator made known through Jesus Christ. So Paul says, we fix our eyes, not on what is seen. Do you catch the irony there? <laughs> we fix our eyes on what is unseen. We can focus our attention. The Greek word is skopeo, 
which comes from the word that means to take aim, to fix our eyes. It speaks of undistracted focus, of finding a mark in the distance and keeping your eyes on that mark as you move toward it. Now, I actually, every time I go golfing, I have the opportunity to practice that discipline of fixing your eyes on a point as you move toward it. Because more often than not, when I tee off and hit my shot with the driver, it lands in the weeds instead of in the fairway. And if I want to find the ball, I have to watch where that ball lands, and then I have to keep my eyes on that spot as I walk there. And if I get distracted by a conversation, or if I'm looking around or see a bird, I will lose my focus and lose the ball. I'm the only one that does that, I'm sure. Paul says something similar in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, but he uses a different word. He uses the word phraneo, which is actually a difficult word to translate because it refers to both the mind and the heart. And so some translations will put it, set your mind on things above. Others will will put it, set your affections on things above. The point is, the idea that Paul is conveying there is think about. Focus your whole being on the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Because even though it is unseen, heaven is our true home. The seen things cannot satisfy and they will not last but the unseen things are eternal. So just as last week we saw that Scripture calls us to cultivate a spirit of praise in our lives, to embark upon a discipline of praising God, it also calls us to the discipline of fixing our eyes on our true home. Just as it's so easy to become consumed by the difficulties that we face in life and lose sight of how amazing and praiseworthy God is, we also can easily become preoccupied by the now and forget that we were not made for this world. But we have been called to journey to a city that is not made by human hands that God himself has prepared for us and where he himself dwells. So let us fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. It is passing away. But what is unseen is eternal. Charles Spurgeon speaks to this issue uh, in a devotional that uh, I have been reading, Sharon and I have been reading in the mornings. And I want to read just, it's actually an extended quote from, from what he says about this, but I think it speaks very much to what I've been trying to convey to you this morning from God's word. Spurgeon says, in our Christian pilgrimage, it is well to be looking forward Forward lies the crown, and onward is the goal. The future must be the grand object of the eye of faith. Looking into the future, we see sin cast out, the body of sin and death destroyed, the soul made perfect and fit to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Looking further yet, We can see death's river past and the hills of light attained on which stand the celestial city. We can see ourselves entering within the pearly gates, hailed as more than conquerors, crowned by the hand of Christ himself and embraced in the arms of Jesus. The thought of this future may well relieve 
the darkness of the past and the gloom of the present because the joys of heaven will surely compensate for the sorrows of earth. Hush, my fears. This world is but a narrow span, and you shall soon have passed it. Hush, hush, my doubts. Death is but a narrow stream, and you shall soon have crossed it. Time, how short. Eternity, how long. Death, how brief. Immortality, how endless. I think even now I taste the banquet and sip of the well that is within the gate. The road is so, so short. I shall soon be there. Perhaps you have joined us today online and you sense in yourself the restlessness that St. Augustine was talking about, that yearning for something that nothing in this world can satisfy. You have that yearning because you were created for a better country. And there is a hole in your heart that only God can fill. But there is only one way to that country. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There is no more important decision that you could ever make than to entrust your life to Christ and turn to him for salvation and forgiveness. I pray that you will not let another day go by before you do so. There are resources on our website that can help you understand what God's purpose is in creation and why it is that we need a Savior. You can take some time if, you, if, you, uh, if you're so inclined to read about the plan of salvation that's there on our website. And of course, feel free to contact us here at the church if you have any questions or if you would like someone to pray with you. God has prepared a home for us. My prayer is that we will journey home together. Let's pray. Father, when we stop and think from all of our step back, from all of our busyness and striving and the things that we are searching for and hoping will satisfy us, when we stop and step back, we realize that we have yearnings that this world cannot satisfy. We thank you so much that you have not created us in this way and given us desires and yearnings that cannot be satisfied, but in fact, you have given us a desire for something that you intend to satisfy beyond measure. As Jesus said, you are like a well to us, overflowing unto eternal life where our hunger and our thirst will be satisfied. Father, I pray that you will teach us just as we need to lift up our eyes and to, to turn our, our hearts and our eyes and our minds toward what is good and praiseworthy, to, to learn the discipline of, of living with a spirit of praise. Father, I pray that you will also teach us the discipline 
of living in light of eternity. That we would fix our eyes on those things that are unseen. And in the doing of that, Lord, we are confident that you will change us that you will transform us, that the work that you promise will be finished then is already taking place now. As we keep our eyes on you, as we keep our eyes on our true home, and as we journey there as your people. Help us, Father, we pray, In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Until we are able to gather here in the sanctuary, may God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. Amen.